Celtics Talk podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com. You'll save more at Route 24. What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. A very special episode because on this most recent road trip, the Celtics secured the 1,000th win of this Celtics ownership group with Wick Grossbeck and Steve Pagliuca leading the way. And in this edition, we're going to sit down with Wick and Steve to reflect on buying the team and the championship season of 2008. You can look for a whole bunch of features from the last 20, that's what we're calling it, throughout the season here at NBC Sports Boston and on our pregame live program. You know, when I reflect back on this era and the, the it's crazy that it's been 20 years is the, is the first thing that jumps to mind. But uh, I think one of the things you'll hear Wick and Steve talk about that's been super important is putting the right people in charge of this. And whether that's at the GM or the coach position, the Celtics have gone out of their way to make sure that leadership is strong and consistent. And I think back to just hiring Danny Ainge as the guy that, to, 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 to mold this back into a contender and ultimately deliver that 2008 title and really sort of put the core together for this team uh, that is now seeking banner 18. Uh, but even just getting Brad in that position after the, the, the moving on from Danny, I think it, it's been super important for this ownership group to have the right pieces in place. But enough of me talking about it. Let's hear that interview with Wick and Steve talking about how they put the right people in the right places. Here we are in September of 2022, and it's, believe it or not, the 20 year anniversary of when Wick Grossbeck and Steve Paliuka came together and bought the Boston Celtics. So Wick and Steve, uh, this is, we wanna start off by asking a little bit about the life-changing story of coming together, purchasing the Boston Celtics. The team was worth a record $360 million at the time. It's now valued at 3.55 billion, according to a Forbes calculation done before the NBA Finals. Could you guys tell us a little bit about the story, uh, how you both became the faces of one of the most iconic franchises in professional sports and how this moment 20 years ago, this month, changed the course of both of your lives? Well, uh, I was sitting there at age 41, uh, wondering what I really wanted to do because I was doing something in investing that wasn't just exactly raising my pulse rate or excitement level enough and thought about trying to become involved with the Boston team in ownership. And uh, once I thought of that and was able to get in touch with the Celtics owner, uh, a very nice guy that lived down in Manhattan, met him down there and reached a handshake with him on a, on a price for the team, a record price. We didn't know what it was worth, but he named a number and I accepted it. And I called Steve basically right away and said, I've got a team under contract please come to my house, I'll tell you which one it is. And Steve arrived in Celtics gear head to toe and he said, I must, have, I must be the Celtics, it's a great idea. You wanna take it from there? <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we had known each other uh, from our kids going to school together and living near each other. And, and uh, so I was thrilled when I got the call from Wick and, and uh, yeah, we did, we, I, I think if you step back, we're huge Boston sports fans and huge Celtics fans before this, which, which made this um, you know, a labor of love for, for both of us, and uh, and so we hit it off immediately, and and uh, and we, we we charged in there. It probably didn't help that it said record price at the time because it was a record price, um, as as we spoke to other investors. But uh, uh, it worked out pretty well. Just one follow up: What was it like that first press conference? I look back at some of those pictures and the video. First press conference, and then the first few months as you guys took took the reins. Well, that it was. I, I, it seems like yesterday. It was about. Uh, 88 degrees, humid. Uh, Wick picked me up in his car, which uh, the famous story of I got trapped in his car, so I almost didn't make it to the press conference because uh, he bounded out of the car. It was a brand new car, and I, I couldn't find the locks, and so I'm in this. Uh, I did not lock <laughs> him in, by the way. This was, I had nothing to do with having him be I've, locked I've almost fatally in a, my car. I've got a suit on him. After about five minutes, I'm soaked, so I wrote, I wrote help on the fog, and Wick saw me, came out, got me. But I think we were both surprised in that we'd both been involved in venture capital and finance and done many deals. And in those kinds of deals, you know, maybe two or three reporters show up or you report on a large thing. We walked in and there had to be the over a hundred reporters there and lights and the, the whole nine yards. And I remember that. It, well, I do it's remember. pretty stunning. And then just at that moment when we're announcing that we're gonna buy the team and we didn't have our group put together, but everybody took it as well and then it, it's done. They must have bought the team. 
we still had three months to go to organize the group and raise the money. Uh, David Stern called and said, I'll meet you in Springfield, Mass. tonight at 7 p.m., the, the Hall of Fame induction, coming out and meet everybody. So all the owners of the league uh, were there. Larry Bird was there, uh, I think, being inducted. Bill Walton introduced him. And we were introduced just to the, the, the other owners as the new owners of the Celtics. And we're like, well, we're, we're, uh, we hope to be. <laughs> <laughs> We're not yet, but as far as everybody was concerned, it was done already. We still had three months of work putting together our amazing partnership, and we wouldn't be here without the other 20 uh, families and, and people who invested alongside us. Uh, so we're very grateful to them. By the way, we were very concerned, again, on the way over. I think people heard this story. We turned on Sports Radio, and Sports Radio is great at sports, but not at business. And, and they said, Celtics purchased for seven hundred and twenty million dollars. I said, did we did we miss a comma in there, in there somewhere?" And I think they had they had assumed we were buying fifty percent for the three sixty and multiplied it by two. But and so what did I say? I said, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." Just to see how you reacted. <laughs> <laughs> Little finance joke. Anyway, yeah. uh, we uh, it all worked out great. But we didn't do it for the money. We didn't do it for return on investment. We didn't do it for any of that. It's just the truth. And people have known us for twenty years. Um, I think can corroborate this, but we did this and so did our whole group for the love of being part of Celtic Pride and trying to bring uh, championship basketball back to Boston on the court, off the court, and so that's been our driving force. And so you took over the franchise and we want to take a quick look at uh, the head of basketball operations that you guys have had over the years. There have actually only been two of them. So Steve, I want to start with you on this one. Danny Ainge in 2003 was on the job for 18 years. Could you take us through Danny's tenure as the head man as bas of basketball operations? Of course, won a title in 2008, constructed powerhouse teams from 2008 to 2012, and he set the wheels in motion for the next great Celtics teams with the 2013 Nets trade and ultimately departed in 2021. So I know there's quite a bit there, but Steve, again, start with you. I know there was a relationship there, but uh, just discuss the Danny Ainge era with the Boston Celtics as an executive. Well, we, became, we were very fortunate in that uh, Wick and I talked and we were interviewing several candidates for general manager. And uh, I had known Danny from being on a charitable board, board with him and knew he was a great basketball mind and very well connected. So we called him and he said, yeah, I, I, I'll come up with a list of names for you. And we had some meetings. And then I actually flew out um, to see Danny to, uh, to talk about those names. And when I landed, he said, uh, you know, I don't have a list of names for you because I like the job. So I was kind of shocked. I called Wick immediately. And, uh, and Wick said, hey, sounds, sounds good to me. He flew in, interviewed Wick, interviewed some of the other guys we had involved. And uh, we thought Danny was special because he, he's one of the few people that has experience as a, as a player, a star player, um, Boston uh, experience specifically. He'd been a, a, a scouting. He'd been in, in general management. He'd been a coach. Um, so his, his, he's a college, great college player, so his pedigree was incredible. We had high hopes for Danny, which I think were fulfilled over those 20 years. Uh, he came in immediately, and uh, you know, no one works harder than, than, than Danny, maybe except for Brad. Uh, uh, we, we've had been lucky to have two of them, but um, Danny worked really hard, and great, that great knowledge base came in. And also kind of, I think, drew us back into the, in, in, drew us back into the Celtics days when they had championships, and that's what we wanted to do. It was so key that Steve made that introduction and had that relationship with Danny, and that really changed everything. So kudos to Steve for, I mean, it's what partners do, and he really stepped up then. And now we'll move on to the coaching hires. During the 20 years, there have only been Look three no coaches. Look no further than the award-winning 24 with Auto Rivers Group. With over 2,600 vehicles in stock, uh, the brands you love, backed by the savings and service you can count on. Powerhouse Visit today or shop online at 24autogroup.com. We're kicking final off season in with big savings at State Line Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, Ram. Lease a new Ram 1500 for three sixty nine a month during Ram Power Day. Hurry in, and you'll be saying, I Played against Doc, and we had a lot of battles together. I've watched him from afar, and I think it was top of the list. Danny had a list of, of folks that we'd interview. And uh, when Wick and I met uh, Doc, we agreed with Danny. Doc has been you know, an NBA fixture, a great leader, and developer of players. And so we felt he'd be good for the young players that were going to come in, and also great for veterans that we'd hoped to attract to the, fran to the franchise. And uh, he fulfilled that promise as well. And you know, that, I think 
Doc, for a, a few years, was the second longest tenured coach in the NBA. I think we've had a few of them now because we've had long tenures. Um, but uh, you know that, that championship year was incredible, and, and I always uh, think about and give him a lot of credit for having a vision that championship year of, of Ubuntu, which means if if someone helped you, you have to help somebody else, and and that kind of infused the whole organization in that championship year. And if you remember, before every game there'd be a huddle, and, and the players would get together and they, they'd scream Ubuntu, and go out there, and, and 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 that kind of set the whole thing in motion. So, and it stayed stayed with us to this day. We have a very cohesive group, very excited about this team, and I think it has a lot of those same characteristics. Well, Steve and I both played uh, college sports. Steve was skilled enough to play basketball at Duke. I, I was in a minor sport at another place, not at a, you know, not like basketball. But, but he was good at a minor sport, and I was bad at a major sport. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> but, but I think hiring coaches for us is, is sort of, would we follow this coach? Um, you know, it's not just like an academic exercise who has the best stats uh, from being a coach or anything else. You, you meet somebody and you say, this person uh, can lead uh, guys to new heights, and and part of it is drawing maybe on your own experience, uh, even if it, even if it's rowing or even if it's basketball. You know, a few years ago, um, and but uh, Doc just you meet Doc, you know that he's all in. You know he can lead people, and he did a fantastic job. Very inspirational coach, for sure. Talked about the beginning years here. We'll go forward to the 2008 championship season. And we'll start with two monumental trades uh, after a 24-win season in 2006-2007. Ray Allen, of course, acquired on draft night, and then Kevin Garnett on July 31st of that year. Obviously, there's quite a bit on the bone there from the summer of 2007, but if you could, and either one who wants to start here, just uh, the summer of 2007, everything turned at a 90-degree angle. Well, I think, I think uh, uh, it started with uh, 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 really, really uh, picking a great draft choice of, of Al Jefferson, which you know, made us more competitive with, uh, with, with Al and Paul. And, uh, and then Al was sought after the league. And, and so the, the, the kind of the, the, the double backflip of getting Ray Allen and, and Garnett in here at the same time to have, uh, have an instant big three was, was a fantastic goal Danny was pursuing. And, uh, and he put the pieces in place with, with the draft. And I think one key thing was they also wanted Rondo, and we thought Rondo uh, was, was a fantastic player. And the, the story on Rondo is uh, we were in the draft room, and they, our guys were shocked that Rondo had fallen, I think, to, to, after the 20th pick. He wasn't picked, and we had 21. And, uh, and Danny came to Wick and I and said, you know, can we spend, was a million bucks on Rondo? Um, can we spend, can, Some can, number. Can, we, can we buy this pick for... A million bucks. And we Seems had, cheap now. Yeah, we had uh, we had about the, we had I think uh, 38 seconds to decide, and so we looked at each other and said, "What do you think, Danny? Yeah, I think he could be a really good player." And so getting Rondo and then uh, making those trades, I think, gave us that 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 core to uh, to build upon getting that championship. And and with just to follow again on draft night with Ray, people were saying there's one more move to come. If you could speak to that, and then with. With Kevin, again, I know that there was the back and forth with Glenn T Taylor that we've spoken about, and then mm -hmm. you were on the beach, and I think mm -hmm. Steve was overseas. And just if you could talk about that that moment and, and how it was, okay. th things were changing. <laughs> well, the draft night, I remember one of my good friends who's since passed away, uh, unfortunately, but a great, great person, sent me a text and said, you guys are out of your mind trading for Ray Allen. This is just to cancel my tickets. You know, this is one of my friends, okay? Um, and I, I, so I saved that text later when, you know, when he asked to be reinstated, we reinstated him. But uh, there was a lot of con concern and confusion out there. We don't talk about what's going on, what's behind the scenes, what our future plans are. We try not to or at the Celtics. We just try to just do it. And, um, and so we weren't letting people know that, that Danny had had his sights on Garnett literally for like three years. And he was hoping that with Paul and Ray and the supporting cast that that'd be enough for Kevin to choose us because Kevin was effectively a free agent. He, he's really got to choose where he would go and because he had to agree to a sign and extend. So um, uh, anyway, it, it was three years plus in the making and we still felt we had a chance, but we didn't have Kevin signed up yet. And Danny ended up getting him at the end of July. So. And that other story was just, uh, it fell to me, uh, Glenn Taylor wanted to talk to me about the trade and we've already, I've already talked about this, uh, so I don't want to belabor it, but um, it just, we just had to make sure um, that we got the deal done and that he didn't take Rondo 
And so I said, look, you can have another player uh, who we included, and, uh, and I said, and we'll pay his salary, and you can have him for free, but you have to tell me by five o'clock, and at 4.30, I went out for a run, and I picked up the phone on the run, and, and the first things he said, he's a very gracious guy, he said, congratulations on probably winning the 2008 championship. So that's how I knew we had the deal done. And it was, it was great. Danny, Danny uh, is very strategic, and this was like putting a, a puzzle together. And, and Rondo was one piece of the puzzle. You know, Ray Allen was another piece of the puzzle. And then it fell into place, that, that Kevin Garnett, and, and, and doing great drafting, so we had the assets. We, we actually, at the time, had the best deal for Minnesota. You know, Jefferson turned out to be a very, very good player. So um, it's one of those things where, you know, you take a shot at it, and thank goodness that whole plan came together. And I was... Uh, I was at, we, we gave a presentation to the, to the investor group, uh, and I happened to be, in, I think, in Italy on vacation. I remember because I was getting like the old curl faxes. the last vacation he ever took. I, <laughs> I swear, he works 24-7, this guy. So it was in the middle of the night, we gave this presentation, and, and, and at the time, you know, people said, well, maybe Garnett is, is, is too old, maybe Allen's too old, and, and we thought not. We thought their health was good. And, uh, and, and so we got everybody on board because it was a huge contract, a huge contract at that time. Um, and it paid off, and you know, Kevin, I think laid the groundwork for the next, you know, the next ten years in, in terms of that bringing back that Celtic pride and, and that intensity. And we can give Flat Doc up. all so much credit, which we do. We give uh, Ray and Paul and Rondo and Perk and everybody else a ton of credit. But Kevin Garnett walked in and he informed everybody on the team that we were going to win that year, or he was going to like personally murder them, and or whatever he was going to do. But he said, you know. We're, going, we're doing this my way, and we're going to end up with a parade. And I think KG really was, um, you know, the heart and soul of just, you know, taking that team to another level. He just would accept nothing less, and, and everybody rose to the occasion, but he was really the instigator. There, Wick just said a key, a key word in the franchise, which, which uh, we've, we've, we've not talked about the initial relationship with Red Auerbach, which I think is really important because... We talked the, the day we really had this happen. We said we got to go get Red back in the fold. He hadn't been involved in the previous group at all, and we wanted to bring him back. And so we went down to his office, and the first thing he told us was, "Before you guys talk to me, I got to tell you one thing: you got to bring in instigators, not retaliators, for players." And that that was his his uh, his his huge advice. And Red was an instigator, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, if there was ever any trouble brewing, Red started it, <laughs> and um, he'd finish it too. He was unbelievable. Yeah, and he jumped he jumped on board, and you know, was a lot of help to us. And, and we had him involved in the basketball meetings. You know, when we hired Danny Ainge, he he blessed he blessed that. And um, you know, when we talked about Danny, we had a you know a classic venture capital presentation. Danny has this skill, that skill, this skill, and he, and he said, "You left out one major thing, guys." And I said, "What is that, Red?" He said, "He's lucky." Mm -hmm. Danny's always lucky, and, and, yeah. and he is. Yeah. Kick off ball with game-winning deals at Route 9 Nissan. Lease a new Rogue Sport for $289 a month. That's right, just $289 a month. Score your game-winning deal now and visit today or online anytime at Route9NissanAuto.com. We're kicking off fall with big savings at Stateline Subaru. Like a new Subaru Crosstrek. Drive home for just $2.99 a month. That's right, only $2.99. Score big savings today. Stateline Subaru, a driver's best friend. So anything back just to the any memorable moment from the regular season or playoff, that whole run that season, I know it started with a great beginning to the season. Anything that sticks out to you from that season that you recall? A couple of things stick out. One, the team really kind of came together, you know, under under Garnett and Doc. It was it was, it was one of the most cohesive teams that we've had. Um, I think I think getting PJ Brown uh, was a real coup. Uh, they worked Made on a that. big shot against uh, Cleveland. And and uh, you know it was kind of it was kind of like the uh, the Don Nelson shot that went off the rim. That was our version of that. You know that team. Uh, we started off strong. We went all the way through strong. We finished strong. Sixty six and sixteen, a great record regular season. I don't remember a lot of the games we'd sort of fall behind or we'd be close and then we'd just kind of blow people out. It was sort of like we were, uh, the team felt that they were definitely better and they were, but they didn't feel they had to always show it in the first, you know, I'd rather win every game by 50 points. It's more relaxing and we won a bunch of teams by probably three points. But it felt like a team that was just on another level. Um, and and when you've got something like that, you can't wait for the next game. You can't wait. You can't miss a road game. You know, you can't miss a home game. Uh, you can't wait. And then all of a sudden we get to the playoffs after this unbelievable season, and we go seven games with Atlanta. 
in seven games with LeBron in Cleveland. And I mean, you know, the, the Pierce-LeBron duel in game seven, thank God these game sevens were at home. But we could have been knocked out either one of those rounds. We had a pretty tough series against Detroit. And then, uh, you know, there was a key moment in the finals, uh, game four, but we can get to the finals, I guess, in a minute. But the team generally, it was just, it was just uh, uh, such a machine and they fed off each other. They were happy for each other. They sacrificed individual stats for one another. Doc had made that point at the beginning. Your numbers are gonna go down, but the wins are gonna go up and a banner is gonna go up. And so the individual numbers for Ray Allen went down. Paul Pierce went down. Kevin Garnett went down in terms of scoring, but collectively the group you know, set records. And we started that season out. Doc wanted this team to bond and so he brought everybody to Rome for training camp, and I'll never forget that I was there. And to see Paul Pierce literally in a gladiator's uniform in the front of the Coliseum, I'm, I'm Italian, and I took some pictures of Paul. He was really getting into it. There were people that sold costumes, and you know, Paul, Paul was a fun-loving guy, so he, he bought one of these gladiator costumes, and he, and he, had, he had the ax yeah. standing up there with the team following him. And every day, they had practice. We, we were in a hotel on one side of Rome. The practice facility was on this side of Rome, and they were basketball crazy over there. They had at least 20 motorcycle cops in, the, in rush hour in Italy, in Rome, bring us through the city. It took us, it took us like 15 minutes. It would have taken three hours without the cops. The whole city of Rome stopped and the Celtics bus went through every day. I, 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 was, I thought that was, I was blown away by that whole thing. And there was one policewoman with bright red hair that was leading the pack, getting all the people out of the way. And the Celtics bus would roll through. So there was great excitement. And the players really did bond in, in, in Rome um, and had, and had uh, games against teams over there and came back really ready to play. And then moving ahead to playing the Lakers in the finals, Game Four, which, like you mentioned, uh, winning the NBA Finals at home, one thirty-one to ninety-two against your arch rival, championship parade down the streets a couple of days later. I think what I really want to hit on here, Wick, we'll start with you. Just so here we are, five and a half years later, you got you purchased this team, and now you've done it. You this team has won a championship. So just take me behind the door of the the that series, the Lakers series, and then specifically winning in game six and the celebration, your interactions with each other and then those next few days. Well, this, this started back when we named the company Banner 17 um, that was gonna acquire the Celtics. And, and it, because it was about banners and it was about pride and doing the right thing on and off the court in the community. It was not about anything else. And, and so uh, that became clear in the first press conference, Bob Ryan or somebody asked me, what's this Banner 17 stuff? I go, well, they've only got 16 hanging up there. This is in 2002 when we closed on the purchase. And he said, well, are, uh, but 17, are you, wait a minute, are you guaranteeing a championship? You've just only been here five minutes, says the, you know, the owners. And you're saying you're gonna win Banner 17? I mean, this is kind of like unheard of. And I said, well, it, I decided not to start my whole career here with anything other than the authentic truth. But I said, it means we're gonna win Banner 17 or I'm gonna die trying. So that was the goal. And and five and a half fortunately, years, he was very young. I'm still alive, <laughs> yeah, I'm still alive, still here. Um, but what a thrill, I mean, that's all we wanted was, was that win and, um, and when we did win game four, when we had been down more than 20 points, the Lakers, it, we were up 2-1 in the series. We were in LA and we fall behind by I think 26 points. And uh, it's like, oh, well, it's gonna be 2-2. Two -two. This is a dogfight. And then all of a sudden, back we come. And we won that game. I just got goosebumps. So we're up 3-1 with two more home games left. And uh, yeah, so that was, we that were, was the we turning were, point uh, of the whole thing. I remember thing. we were sitting together on the baseline. We were sitting next to Spider-Man, yeah. Toby McGuire. Yeah. He, was, he was, he was, yeah. was and we had And we had the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, we, we were, were kind of for you. the lunch pail guys from Boston. and, and uh, the celebs were, you know, they were ahead by 20, and we're like, yeah. you know, they go, you have no chance. And yeah. so that was incredible when we came back and won that yeah, game. It that was, was uh, that's when you, I mean, you know, so you mentioned the final score, we won by 39 points. I drove up uh, here from my, uh, my home in my car. We have Celtics license plates. Mine is Celtics 39, because 39 was our margin. Not too many people know what 39 would mean on my license plate, but that's what it means. By the way, it was nice to have a championship game where you could relax in the fourth quarter. <laughs> be, be, you knew we couldn't lose it being ahead by 30. Because I've relaxed ever <laughs> since. <laughs> just a brief follow on just the night when you won it, just the experience with, with you two. Anything that you recall in your celebratory 
evening or the, in the days that follow. Steve probably drank an inch of alcohol, which is a rare event. <laughs> I'm drinking now, though. He has a te tequila company, so I've become, I've become a lush. Uh, such great tequila. Um, it tastes good. Uh, I, I remember as soon as the game ended, uh, the, the apocryphal Gatorade, and normally it's yellow Gatorade, but somehow we had, we had uh, uh, red Gatorade that night, and they dumped it on Doc. And I was sitting right near Doc, happened to be sitting, and Doc came over and gave me a big hug, and I got Gatorade, and his shirt was full of Gatorade, and there's a great picture of, of the Gatorade moment. And, and uh, Wick was celebrating with the players, and, we, and you know, we were jumping around crazy. I mean, it's really, you really got a feel for these players. I don't think the fans even understand that the 100 games, uh, all, all, the, all the wear and tear and the travel and, and how hard these guys work, and it's rare to get a championship. It's very, very hard to get a championship. Uh, fortunately, the Celtics have a lot of them, and, and hopefully we're going to contend for more. Uh, but I think we were all just so happy for the players and the coaches and, and Danny Ainge who had worked so hard to bring Boston back you know, to, to where it should be in the championship. And, and uh, it, was, it was really nice to remember. There was confetti and fans. Winning at home is great. They hand us the trophy. I didn't have anything prepared to say because it felt like bad luck. Uh, so I dedicated it to Red Auerbach, which... Uh, came from the heart. You go into the locker room, it's all plastic everywhere, taped off so that the clothes are all protected and there's champagne everywhere and within 30 seconds you're shin deep in champagne on the floor. I've got a picture in my office of Garnett. Somebody grabbed me from behind, poured a bottle of champagne on my head. The picture is Garnett, like a, a villain, like grinning with that, with that grin, pouring champagne on my head. Uh, it ended up at 3, 4 in the morning for me um, and uh, went home and there were, I went out on Causeway Street from the parking lot, players' parking lot, and figured it's 4 in the morning. It's going to be pretty empty and it, was, it took 45 minutes to get out of the street. There were still 500,000 or something people out there. Um, phone was ringing. As I got to sleep at maybe 4.30 or 5. The phone is ringing at 7 a.m. next to my bed. I'm, I'm like, this is funny. The number's unlisted. This is back when we had landlines. Pick it up and they say, please hold for the White House. It's President Bush inviting us to the White House. Congratulate. Make sure you congratulate Steve and Doc and Danny. Great job. Ubuntu. And I'm like, is this a dream? And I look next to the bed and there's the trophy, which I had just taken home for safekeeping. I didn't want to leave it in that mayhem. And I'm like, it's not a dream because there's a trophy right there. I mean, this is just, it's just surrealistic. You can't imagine, oh, I couldn't imagine it until it happened. Um, and we almost had another one this summer, but we didn't. And hopefully we'll be back there. The, the, and we had that uh, fantastic White House trip. We had a great time yeah. in Washington, D.C. Um, and every, everything went really smoothly. Uh, 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 except when I, I, I had to go to the men's room before we left and I kind of got lost in the White House and I, I had to find my way out of there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck in my car, lost in the White House. Look, he's a great partner. We just have to, we have a beeper. <laughs> we, we have minders. Well, and, then the, and then the unknown story is, the unknown story is the White House dog was wandering around that terrier that, that President Bush had right. and it bit one of us and it nipped at me. So I, went, I, 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 I got the person out of there and I went to the, the head of security in the White House when I find my, found my way out of the men's room and I said, hey, look, the dog bit somebody. <laughs> Let's keep it low key. Right. And he, go, he goes, oh, I'm not surprised. He, 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 he bit the president of France last week. I said, well, why did you have him here for the thing? Steve's but, a little bit accident prone. I mean, none of this happens to me. You know, it's like I can open the car door. I can find my way around. I didn't get bit, bitten by a dog, but yeah. that's right. We're doing great, Steve. Good thing we have each other. Closing thoughts, uh, big picture reflections. Wick, starting with you, you, bought the, you guys bought the team when the Red Sox were red hot, getting ready to break the curse. The Pats dynasty was taking off. The Bruins, of course, all play in the same season as, as your team. Uh, usually they have competitive clubs, won the title of their own, and got there a few other times. They've had success. Could you expound upon Boston sports in the 21st century? This really is the, the golden era of sports in this region and how the Boston teams have driven each other. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I was born in Worcester in 1961, lived in Boston my whole life, except for a few detours around school or whatever, but uh, born and raised. And um, I was a fan of all four sports teams, uh, pro teams, with my dad going to the games and then had partial season tickets to all of them when then this idea came up. So the, the, our DNA here in Boston is our pro teams and, or most of us. Are, are that way and it's definitely my DNA and Steve's DNA and we uh, you know the chance to be part of this 20-year run 
and to have a championship of our own and a couple more finals, but also to see the Patriots go crazy, the Red Sox go crazy, the Bruins win. You know, we hang out. I, I see, uh, I probably see ownership from the other three teams, you know, all three of them every month. Uh, I mean, or every two months. Um, I'll, I'll see the Crafts and, and the Henrys next week at an event, you know, and Steve's the same way. So we, we do support one another. The fans in Boston will support all four teams. You don't have to choose. Uh, if you're a fan, you just support them all. And we appreciate it, and it feeds these teams, and it keeps us, you know, we've been sold out for years. We have this huge waiting list. We wish we had a bigger arena to accommodate everybody. We appreciate everybody's support, and, and it's working. And Boston has become a proud city. It used to be kind of a sort of a, you know, head down kind of place, I think. Having grown up here, I'll say it. It, it used to be kind of like a, depressing, lower energy place. It is, uh, we're so full of ourselves in Boston now, nobody else likes it. That's the way we want it to be. Boston is very unique in that uh, I think it has probably the closest knit uh, sports community. And part, part of that is because the pro sports dominate here. Um, part of it is because everybody works together in, in charities. We work uh, with Children's Hospital, the Shamrock Foundation, with all the other clubs. I really haven't seen this kind of closeness and cooperation. We go to their games, they go to our games. You see, you know, Robert Kraft's been a fixture at our games for, for a long time. Jonathan Kraft, the Henrys, um, it, it's, it's, it's just really great. And we're all fans of the four sports. So uh, I think this all starts that we started out as fans to, to become owners. We, didn't, we weren't owners uh, to be fans. We were fans first and community first and it's all come together. It makes it even better. Um, and, and, and we never discuss, you know, we're competing with the Red Sox or, or, or the Patriots. We, we go to their games, we hope everybody gets lifted up. And I think, typical example, Brady coming to help us recruit a player, where else does that happen? Well, that happens because everybody sees Boston and, and, and wants to try to help Boston to win and, and, and retain that kind of championship entree. When we came in, there were 11,000 tickets sold for 18,000 seat games when we came in. The team was being run uh, uh, not, not how it was being run, it just wasn't being well received in town. And the first thing that the Patriots did, and we knew Robert Kraft a bit, but not that well, they said, here's our season ticket holder list, why don't we try to do a joint thing, you buy Patriots tickets, you get some Celtics tickets, or the other way around. Uh, I don't remember exactly what, but a generous gesture like that from the Patriots, from uh, the Bruins were very helpful, the Red Sox. You know, we won in 08, uh, and there we are in the duck boats going around Fenway Park, you know, with the trophy, and, you know, it, it just doesn't get any better than being a Boston sports it's fan it's or it's sports it's owner. It saved us a lot of trouble because I remember, uh, specifically Wick and, and myself, we used to, when we first bought the team, we used to go around with big wads of tickets in our pocket because we had about 7,000 unsold tickets. <laughs> and and at gas stations, and you know, you, I know you gave them to the guy at the West. I printed up cards station, and said, "Please and, come and, to the game." And and, and 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 people at the hotels, and so we took great joy in, in just showing up and, and 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 anytime just digging in and giving out tickets. It's a little harder now, though we still do it, but it's a little harder now that it's sold out. But uh, we had plenty of tickets in the in the in those dog days till we till we started to build it back. But the fans came back and, and they trusted uh, the patient approach. And and uh, again, just great thanks to the fans. Great great to be here in Boston. award-winning 24 Auto Group. With over 2,600 vehicles in stock, the brands you love. Backed by the savings and service you can count on. Visit today or shop online at 24autogroup.com. We're kicking off fall with big savings at Stateline Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. Lease a new Ram 1500 for $369 a month during Ram Power Days. Hurry in and you'll be saying, I'll buy the Stateline.